So uh, I'm Manny Velasquez. I teach at uh, Santa Clara University. Um, I've been teaching there too many years now to count, since um, 77, 1977. Um, I used to teach in the philosophy department, which is where I uh, was tenured. Uh, and then I um, uh, was offered a chair over in the business school in business ethics, the Dirksen uh, Chair of Business Ethics, which I uh, took, and I've been since then, since um, I think it was 1980, I've been teaching in the business school. Uh, I started off teaching uh, courses in general ethics in the philosophy department. Then I was asked uh, by the dean of the business school to develop some courses in business ethics. I thought, well, I'll, I'll read up a little bit on business in the summer, and I'll be ready in the fall. Uh, as I started reading, I realized that was a crazy idea. So I went back to the classroom, um, got the equivalent of an MBA at our own school, our own institution. And then uh, two years later, I finally started teaching business ethics. I taught it for a few years while I was in the philosophy department. So I went over to the business school. I began teaching business ethics there. Um, and uh, while I was there, um, I also began teaching uh, business public policy. The more I taught public policy, I realized it was really just a part of strategy. And I had been doing a lot of reading and strategy. So I eventually developed uh, an ability, a competency in teaching strategy, business strategy. And I taught business strategy uh, on the undergraduate level for several years. But then um, finally, business ethics kept growing and growing and growing. And I finally gave up on business ethic, on strategy, and then eventually gave up on public policy. And now all I do is uh, business ethics. I'm a one-trick pony again. And, and tell me about your early research. Your, your, you had, you would say, but you have to say, because they're not going to hear me. You have one of the first books in business ethics. So uh, around 1980, um, by that time I was teaching, I'd been teaching uh, business ethics about three, three years or so. Uh, and there were no textbooks at the time. So a, um, uh, I began working at that point on a textbook on business ethics, which was uh, picked up by Prentice Hall. Uh, and it was one of the earliest textbooks on business ethics. Um, there was actually an earlier textbook. It was a collection of readings by Tom Donaldson and Patricia Warehain. Um, but mine would think was the first uh, full textbook, uh, one author textbook uh, on the f in the field. Um, and that was published in, I think it was 1980, it was the first year, by Prentice Hall, uh, which I'm still doing revisions on. Um, Can you, in this book, uh, if I, I, haven't look, I haven't looked at it recently, but you have cases as well as text, right. not just text. Some of the textbooks are just text right. with no cases. So, should I just continue? Yeah. So, um, it just so happened that uh, Jerry Kamenon, uh, who um, was teaching a business ethics at the University of Detroit, was visiting at Santa Clara University that same year that I was working on uh, the textbook. And I gave him the manuscript, and he came back to me shaking his head and saying, uh, this will never do, this will never do. It's, it's all theory. It's philosophy. Uh, it needs to have some practical um, uh, examples or cases and so on. So I went back uh, and um, rewrote the whole thing um, on, at his urging um, with a lot of examples. And it was at that point he gave me the idea of incorporating text uh, cases into the textbook. So when it was published, it was published uh, with the title Business Ethics Concepts, that was me, and Cases, that was Jerry, Concepts and Cases. Um, so it was, it was unlike the uh, textbooks that were published uh, most er in, during that period in that mine did contain uh, cases and a lot of practical examples due to Jerry Cavanaugh. Still going today, I'm convinced. Could be. Absolutely. So, uh, then what was, what's your research stream been since then? What else have you 
written. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are a couple of the things that I've, um, that I'm, uh, remember that are worth uh, remembering in the research that I've done? Um, one is um, developing, this was piggyback actually on um, the uh, work that I had been doing on my textbook, and that was developing a, a framework for thinking through uh, ethical issues in business. Um, at that time, no, no, people weren't quite sure um, how to bring together uh, moral philosophy and the issues that business people had to deal with. How do you bring these very abstract concepts to bear on the problems that business people have in their day-to-day -day work? So um, from my teaching with the students, I had developed this very simple framework for thinking through an issue in business ethics. Basically, it was uh, asking uh, three questions. Um, is what you're doing, does what you're doing uh, respect people's rights, the rights of the people that are involved? Um, is uh, what you're doing consistent with uh, fairness? Is it just? And thirdly, is what you're doing uh, contributing to the overall welfare of a group or society as a whole? Um, any philosopher will tell you that I'm looking at three different streams of um, business ethics research. One, the right stream starting with Immanuel Kant, going on through Locke and so on. Uh, the other one, uh, theories of justice, which begins with Aristotle and goes on through Rawls. Um, and then the third, uh, utilitarianism, which was articulated uh, in the 19th century by Bentham and John Stuart Mill. So that's one of the things that I think I contributed to the field was this way of thinking through business ethics and bringing um, ab these abstract philosophical uh, notions to bear on the practical problems. Uh, another uh, issue that I worked a lot on and actually still work on uh, sometimes was um, uh, what is the nature of a corporation? Not what's the purpose of a corporation, but what... Um, what is it? Um, and the problem on which I focused was whether the corporation was the kind of thing that can be morally responsible for what it does. And my view uh, then was, and still is, that groups, corporations, organizations, and so on, cannot be morally responsible for what they do. That human beings are morally responsible for their actions, and in fact, they are morally responsible for whatever corporate groups do, but corporations themselves are not morally responsible. They're not the same kind of creatures that human beings are. They don't think, they don't sense, they don't feel sorry, they don't have emotions, and so on. And so they don't have the equipment to be morally responsible for what they do. And so if anybody is to blame for what corporations do, it should be the people that are inside and in control of the actions of the corporation, not the corporation itself. Um, what I've been working on uh, later in the later part of my life has been on um, actually on empirical issues, which are about as far away as you can get from uh, the philosophy that I started with. Uh, I've been working on uh, the way in which uh, religion affects what corporations do in the area of social responsibility. <clears throat> so there's a series of papers that I've written with a colleague of mine where he does the numbers and I do all the theory on um, how does religion, for example, affect what corporations do uh, toward their employees? How does it affect what corporations do in the area of diversity? How does it affect what corporations do in the area of the environment? Uh, and I'm working on one right now on how it affects what corporations do in the area of climate change. What did we find? Um, we found actually, which is, since I'm Catholic, this was a nice thing to find, uh, that Catholics, um, the religion, actually has a positive influence on companies in each of those areas. Um, a mainstream or mainline uh, a Protestantism uh, also has a fairly good record in each of those areas. But uh, evangelicals, um, unfortunately, um, either fail to do, have any positive influence in any of those areas, or actually 
surprisingly enough, have a negative influence in some of those areas. They have a negative influence, for example, in the area of the environment and in the area of uh, climate change. Um, you wonder, you wonder, and I wonder for a while, why is it that um, a religious group would have a negative influence on what companies do? Uh, and I think that that's because there are pressures on companies um, to do things which are actually harmful to the environment, financial pressures, and that's to, uh, to pollute and so on, take shortcuts with erase products and so on. So when you combine those negative influences on a company without any breaks being put on by the uh, moral atmosphere around the company that's created by religions, you end up with the religion actually having a, a negative uh, influence on companies. Have you studied Judaism and, and companies that are, for example, Levi Strauss is a, is a Jewish, always been a Jewish run company, and uh, I think you could make a case that it's affected. So, that. so the, uh, the research that I've done has focused on the three groups that I just mentioned, which was the uh, mainstream uh, Protestants, mainline Protestants, Catholics, and Evangelicals, because they are the largest groups in the United States, and our data covered the United States. Um, so we had to leave out uh, uh, the impact of Judaism, the impact of Muslims, and so on. How All these smaller you? groups that weren't large enough for their effect to appear in our data. You might be, because I'm from Idaho, and, and Idaho's partly a Mormon state, but you might look at the influence of Mormons. It's mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. It really makes a difference. That's, that's interesting, yeah. yeah. When, when you ask about religion, are you talking about the religion of the CEO, the board of directors, the oh, employee good, base? Yeah. Good question. So uh, if you ask what's the, what kind of methodology do we use in this, what we did was um, we measured, because there are, there's data on this, we measured the level of religiosity in a given region of the country, in a given county, for example. So how uh, much of the county uh, consisted of practicing Protestants, how much of the county consisted of practicing Catholics, and so on. And then we saw whether there was a correlation between these percentages and what the uh, companies with headquarters in those regions uh, were doing in these various areas. And we found there were, were a, was a definite correlation. In some cases, the correlation was, uh, was uh, small. It was there, but it was small. In other cases, for example, around the environment, uh, it was actually uh, fairly substantial. Well, I can follow up on this religion discussion for just a moment. You're at Santa Clara. That's a Catholic university. Right. Now, we've had a couple conversations with people, and they have suggested that Catholic universities are more hospitable mm -hmm. to the teaching of business ethics. I'm interested in your view on whether you think that's true, whether you've seen that in your career, what mm -hmm. observations you might have on that topic. So when I first began doing business ethics, um, uh, I, it was um, actually, as I mentioned earlier, uh, something that I did because my the bean, dean of the business school came over and asked me to develop a course in business ethics. Um, that was not actually unusual because the school, it was a Jesuit school, and as a Jesuit school, it already had a growing commitment on uh, questions of justice uh, and ethics. Uh, there was already this uh, uh, campus-wide uh, sense that uh, every student should be taking courses in ethics and that business students in particular should be taking courses in business ethics. And Santa Clara, uh, being a Jesuit Catholic university, was not unusual uh, with, uh, when compared to other Catholic and Jesuit universities across the country. Uh, all of the Jesuit universities had begun moving in that direction, and uh, uh, all of the Jesuit and Catholic institutions became fairly congenial places for business ethicists like myself. Right, so yeah. The, the collaborative atmosphere. Yes. Yeah. That did happen. I was not involved with that uh, at Santa Clara. Um, so my background is primarily in academics. 
Mm-hmm. So how do you how do you see the field of business ethics going? What do you, do you see any trajectories you could maybe predict on? I'm being careful here. Uh, how do you, what what do you think we're going to be doing in, in 20 years? And and then the second question is: Have we what have we missed? Are there some issues here we need to focus on that we haven't? So my views on the future of business ethics, um, I'm, I'm actually um, now fairly pessimistic, uh, not of our field, business ethics in particular, but of our future, um, because I do think that we have reached a point, we've passed the point uh, of um, being able to do much about uh, something uh, that I think is going to overtake all of us, and that is, of course, climate change. Um, I think some very tough times lie ahead of us, uh, not just as individuals, but also for our organizations and our business organizations. So I think the big issues that are going to come up in the future are not going to be about what should we do about climate change. I think it's going to be too late to do much about that. But um, what should companies and organizations start doing to adjust to the, um, I almost want to say, catastrophes uh, that lie ahead of us. Um, how do you uh, try to protect what's left of the environment? Uh, how do you try to protect your employees um, uh, as uh, disaster after disaster keeps overtaking us, um, as our forests uh, continue to burn up, as um, water resources become extremely scarce, as food production declines, as all these different things happening, I think the critical issues are going to be around what should companies be doing to deal with all of these um, negative results of uh, climate change. And so do you think we're there? So that's your, your pessimistic side, you would say? Yes. And do you think we can make a difference as business ethicists in that thinking? Or are we sort of talking to the wind? So what can uh, we as ethicists do? Well, I think, um, I think the uh, instinctive thing, um, the instinctive action of businesses is probably going to be to try to protect themselves and continue doing what they're doing. And I think that uh, the role of business ethics is going to be to remind businesses that, um, um, that there are other more important issues that they uh, better start thinking about. Um, I, I'm not sure how effective that's going to be because I think that the uh, pressures on businesses to continue to try to do what they've been doing are going to be pre- fairly strong and fairly powerful. Um, but I think that's going to become the role of ethicists is to be the, the prophets, if you want, uh, in this new environment that we're going to, to be entering in the next several years. Right. You're more hopeful. Well, prophets Good. do more messiah. <laughs> Santa Clara has a center, the Markula Center for right. Ethics. There are probably, I don't know, at this point, close to 200 other centers at other mm-hmm. universities. Right. Do these centers play a role in uh, campus life, in, in research life? Do they catalyze something, or are they something different? What role do ethics centers play in mm-hmm. helping business ethicists move forward, hopefully in more positive Direction. So an, another thing that I'm kind of proud of is that uh, I was the founder of a business ethics center at Santa Clara University. And I was the director of the center for the first five years of its life and then came back again uh, for a temporary period uh, later on in the life of the, uh, of the center. It's now called the Markula Center for Applied Ethics. Um, the Markula Center has had quite an impact. I think it's now... Um, the largest uh, in the United States, possibly in, uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, the center does a number of different, different things. It does, uh, has activities in medical ethics, in political ethics, business ethics, uh, legal ethics, and so on. Um, the, the center has had quite an impact on our own uh, campus at Santa Clara University uh, through all the various student programs uh, that it does and all the uh, assistance that it gives to the faculty in assisting them in incorporating ethics into their courses. Uh, The center also has a lot of outreach activities uh, uh, in these various different areas. Uh, 
outreach to various hospitals in the region and then various companies uh, in the region. And then we have a, uh, a, a fairly significant uh, website, the, the Markula Center uh, website for, for ethics uh, that reaches that now throughout the world. Uh, it's, I think, the most heavily or one of the most heavily visited uh, ethics websites uh, in the world right now. Uh, and if you go on there, you'll find uh, material on ethics for instructors, for teachers, for uh, business people, for medical people, and so on. Uh, it's a wonderful resource to use, and I, I think it's had a pretty positive impact on those fields. And uh, one thing to go back to the idea of the framework you developed years and years and years ago, I know, but that now is, is in the Marcula Center uh, website. You have a whole, whole little kind of uh, right. primer, and, and that has been used widely everywhere. The right. Arthur Anderson Project adopted it thanks to you, and because you were doing that, right? And, and right. but that has been widely adopted, and I hope referenced it. But oh, I found one that wasn't referenced. I said you guys got to. <laughs> but but I think you want that. That's really a huge contribution that you you have made. I think you have to talk a little bit about. That. Yeah. So um, everything tends to be connected. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I had, uh, early in, in my career, I had developed this framework for thinking through ethical issues. So, of course, when I became director of the center, I brought that framework in and used it in the center to, to uh, uh, as a way for people to think about ethical issues uh, in all of these different areas. Um, that, uh, uh, that framework uh, eventually was adopted as the, the framework for the center and still is used by the center as a basic framework for thinking through uh, ethical issues. Uh, because of the role that it played in the center and on the website, uh, it then began to be adopted uh, in a lot of different areas, a lot of textbooks, uh, a lot of different kinds of writings, um, a lot of uh, uh, workshops uh, all go back and use that framework, which we're very happy uh, to have people use. and. We hope they'll keep using it. Question about impact of your work on corporations, on businesses. What have you seen throughout your career uh, in terms of real impact, change in the way businesses run as a result of the work you do or that the center does or did? So in my, early in my career, I was doing some business consulting. And uh, there again, because everything is connected, uh, I, again, used uh, my basic framework as a way that people could use to think through ethical issues uh, for themselves. So that did uh, uh, have a, uh, an impact on uh, the companies that I consulted with uh, during that period. Um, but to tell the truth, I hated consulting. Uh, I hated having to market myself. So after doing that for about maybe five or six years, I, uh, I, I stopped doing that. Um, uh, I do think that other companies also adopted that same way of dealing with ethical issues because uh, eventually the center was taken over by um, Kirk Hansen, who the, was the director until, of the center until last year, and he took over and used that same framework in the consulting that he was doing and then work that the center was doing. Um, so I do think that uh, the work that I did early in my career on this framework and way of thinking uh, through ethical issues has had an impact on the way uh, companies or employees, at least employees and companies, think through the ethical issues that they have. Has, um, have I had any real impact on what companies have actually done? Uh, I hope so, uh, but I tend to think probably not. I think that um, the work that we, all of us, uh, all of business uh, ethicists, um, members of the uh, uh, Society for Business Ethics, as well as uh, members of the Social Issues in Management Division of the Academy of Management, and other ethicists working around the world, I think that their group effort has tended to put uh, uh, pressures on businesses and shown them how to uh, develop ways of thinking about ethical issues. And I think that has had an influence on companies. Um, the work that Kirk Hansen did, who as I say was the director 
of the center there at Santa Clara University um, with uh, the government uh, and with um, implementing uh, requirements on uh, ethics programs in companies also had a tremendous impact on um, what companies have done uh, in this area. To some extent, that's been co-opted by lawyers uh, who have a different way of thinking about ethical issues. Uh, but I think that the work that Kirk has done, that all uh, business ethicists as a whole have done, um, still can, has had a good influence uh, on businesses. Talking of impact, if you were to choose, say, three, three of the pioneers. Of three what? Three pioneers of business ethics. Who would, who would they be and why would you choose them? Three pioneers. Well, one of them, of course, would be uh, Tom Donaldson, uh, who's, uh, whose work has had a tremendous influence on uh, on companies, especially in the way they think about um, uh, issues, uh, international issues in, uh, in business ethics. Um, another person that I think is, uh, has been exemplary is um, um, Goodpaster. Um, I forget his first name. It's Kenneth Goodpaster. Uh, Kenneth Goodpaster also um, uh, did a lot of work with companies, did a lot of work consulting with companies, and also had a tremendous impact, uh, not only on the field, but also on uh, on the way uh, in which companies think about business ethics. Um, Norm Bowie has had a, a big influence on companies. Patricia Warehain has had a, a big influence uh, on the field and on companies. Um, it's, hard, it's hard now for me to put my finger on, on people that are exemplary, but those are some of the names that I think come up to mind of people who have had a, a particularly important influence. Any other comments you'd like to make about this project or what you'd like to say? This is all going to be recorded and short Yeah, short yeah. So I'm glad that Patricia did this. Um, she has been a tremendous leader for our field. Um, Gretchen. And I'm glad that Gretchen uh, also has been sponsoring this. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for doing this.